Now we're going to do the gospel. Please join me in reading Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, that can be found in your pew Bibles in the New Testament on page 51. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I've been so busy decorating downstairs our, East, our Sunday school rooms for what? Easter, Easter right. I'm gonna, I need some helpers today. I got a Easter egg. Oops. Oops. I am not put together today. Ren, can you come up and hold this for me? Skylar, can you hold this for me? Thank you. Oh, I got some helpers. All right, I'll take my egg back for a second. Okay, can anyone tell me? This is my Easter story telling egg. Can anyone tell me what this is? A palm. And when did we use these palms? Can anyone tell me? On Palm Sunday, which was last Sunday, right? And Jesus rode in on a... You missed that? That's all right. <laughs> rode in on a what? A camel. A camel? No, not a camel. A and not a bicycle like Pastor... A donkey or a baby colt. Um, or baby dog. Okay, so this is the first part of our Easter story that started last week. Because we build, like any story, we build up. Oh, I got another egg inside an egg. I need someone to hold my palm one, okay? Oh, what is this? Can anyone tell what that is on there? A what? Yes? A house. You know whose special house this is? The White House. God's house. Jesus' house. Jesus, where he went to learn at, before he went out and ministered for three years. But he was always learning in God's house, and they were always teaching each other. And on the Holy Week, Jesus goes into that temple, and what does he find? He finds God right. He did, but the people there weren't do, behaving very well. They were treating God's house like, 
oh, sort of like the mall or the marketplace. They were selling things that they shouldn't have been selling at, in God's house. And he got mad and he threw a fit. He turned the tables and the, the, the religious leaders didn't like this. And even the, some of the people were a little upset that he did this because they were making money. So that was this one. Let's see what's inside the next egg. All right. Why don't you come up here and hold this egg? Oops. I moved too far, didn't I, Skylar? All right. My next egg. What is this? A heart. What do you think the heart stands for in our, our Easter week story? Love. Right. Jesus, what I love about Jesus' stories and what he taught while he was on the earth for three years, but he, while he was in his ministry for three years, he was on the earth for 30 years. So anyway, it was his love stories. He was always teaching his disciples and the people how to love who? How to love any? Yes. How to love God, which was the number one, and and each other. Very good. So <clears throat> Jesus is always teaching us about how to love God and each other. Would you come up and hold this egg? Okay. Okay. Over here on this side. Can you? Because we're going to put them in order. Okay. And this one, what does that look like? Anything? <laughs> Okay. A pot and a vine. Hmm. Anything else? Yes, it's a jar with perfume coming out of it. One of the stories of the Holy Week is of Jesus being um, a, a lady comes in and she has this jar of very expensive perfume very expensive and she really couldn't afford to to just anoint him pour it on him because she could have sold it and, and made some money but she loved Jesus so much and and honored God so much that she poured this oil on him and <clears throat> so there's the lesson that we can learn from this woman is to always love God and care for each other like she showed Jesus how much she loved him. On this same day, um, Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, he say, decides to betray him. What does he do? Does anyone can tell me that part of the story? He takes how many? 30 pieces of silver. And he tells, what does he, he tell? who Jesus was. He's going to portray him by a kiss. Um, so that was this day. So Judas decides, who's one of the disciples, decides that he is going to portray Jesus. Okay, who wants to do this thing? Okay. All right, and you can stand right over there. Oh. What does that look like? Everybody? Good. Anything else? A bunch of people. A bunch of people at a table. Jesus in his last dinner, the last supper. Very good. See, some of you guys really do know the Easter story. So, Jesus, whoa, oops, leave it on, okay? <laughs> um, Jesus um, gives us something that we're going to practice today that has followed us through the generations. What can that be? What's that table over there? Who said it? Communion. Our communion table is our last supper. He told the, the disciples to do this, to remember him, to drink the wine and break the bread. So that's that one. What's the next one? Things are getting smaller and smaller. Okay, let's see. Who, you want to hold one? All right, you can come on over here. Oh, what? 
What's this? Go ahead. The cross. What do you? It's the cross. Anything else that you see in it? Can you tell me anything? Yes. It's a bunch of colors. What? You forgot. What? It's um, a colorful cross. A what? A colorful cross. Who died on this cross? Jesus. Was it a sad day? Yes. You think everyone cried? You think some people said hooray and some cried? Yeah? All right. So then... What happened after Jesus died on the cross? Here, you can come up and hold that one. Oh, over here, since we're running out of room. Right over here. Oh, you can stay by your sissy. Okay, good go. Yes, what's the... What? He, ro- he rose, not quite yet. This, what does this look like? An egg. An egg? Yes, it does look like an egg. Okay. A What? A rock, yes, this is supposed to represent the rock that they put in front of the tomb because they put Jesus in the, his dead body in the tomb. And then on, so that was Friday evening, and three days later, three days later, three days later, three days later, three days later on Easter morning, but we don't know it's Easter morning yet. Um, the women come to the tomb. They're going to prepare his body. And they wonder, how are they going to get that rock, move that rock? And as they get closer to the rock, what has happened to it? It gets open. It got moved. This big, enormous rock was moved. And they look into the, the cave, the tomb. The, the tomb is like a cave. And what's inside? What's inside? Nothing. What happened to Jesus' body? It came back alive. Do you think those ladies were surprised? Yeah. Do you think they were frightened? Yeah. I think I would be frightened. Where did that body go? Where did it go? What happened next? He came in front of them? Yes, he does appear to someone. But first, the angels told him to go and tell the story, that he is not here, he is risen, and to go back to Galilee. Um, so that is what we're celebrating now, is the, the moment those women saw the empty tomb and know, knew that God is risen. Okay, let's say our prayer. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's go to Sunday school. You guys can carry the pieces and we'll put them together down in Sunday school. A woman looks out of her kitchen window and she is absolutely mortified to find her German shepherd violently shaking the neighbor's pet rabbit in its mouth. 
she didn't get along too well with them and so she had to do something so she rushes out with the broom and begins to pummel her dog until the rabbit was set free well the rabbit was dead and she panicked and so she quickly took it back home washed it under the kitchen sink uh, combed it so that it looked fluffy again she put on a little white paint and a little makeup to make it look alive and then quietly she snuck back into the neighbor's yard and put the rabbit back into the cage well as expected an hour later she heard screams coming from next door and pretending like she didn't know anything about it she went to the neighbor and asked what happened and she cried the neighbor cried our rabbit our rabbit he died one week ago and we buried him and now he's back we assume that whatever dies stays dead but every year at easter it seems like to some of us and to the world outside that we take out our savior from the grave dress him up and put him back where he should belong on the altar we assume that the witnesses to jesus and his resurrection was somehow gullible that 2000 years ago they didn't have what we have today nbc or cnn or some other news outlet to reliably record some of these events to tell the truth that somehow they were fooled by the hysteria that took over them cs lewis calls this chronological snobbery if you think of what we hear today the earth is flat drinking detergents will heal some illnesses ufo's weirdos who is gullible maybe 2000 years ago they were on to something well many messiahs had come at the time of jesus many claimed to be the messiah and many were even crucified like jesus but none of them claimed to come back to life well many of them were quite happy to worship their teachers at their uh, tombs and they were made shrines places of pilgrimage but these disciples who followed jesus defied tyrants and dictators to worship jesus to claim what they did they were willing to be burned alive to be thrown to lions for their faith hardly something anyone would do today if you really believe something right they could have chosen to disband to go back to their homes but there were some who hated jesus but when they witnessed the resurrection they were changed forever saul became paul those who saw the empty tomb were transformed at the appearance of jesus as paul says in first corinthians he appeared first to peter and then the other disciples and then 500 others 500 hardly a man's tall tale isn't it why does it matter what difference does the resurrection make why is it important to us to hold to that fact that the jesus of nazareth came back to life let me suggest three reasons why this is of immense importance the resurrection assures us of god's 
forgiveness. The resurrection assures us of God's forgiveness. All of us sin. Who doesn't have a skeleton or two in our closets, right? Something that we have said or done or thought in the past. Our conscience nags us, torments us, condemns us. Mark Twain said, man is the only animal that blushes and the only animal that needs to. We are ashamed of what we have done, things in the past that maybe no one else knows, but we do. Nobody is free who is unforgiven. But the Christian good news is that there is forgiveness with God. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. When we come together for communion, we remember the words of Jesus who said that his blood was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Linked with the forgiveness is his death. And our guilt, our sin, our shame is buried. But how do we know that is a fact, that it is true? Remember what Jesus told the crowd as he healed the paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven, but how would you know which is easier to show? To say that your sins are forgiven or to say, rise up and walk. And so for your sake, rise up and walk. That was evidence of that man's sin being forgiven. For us, the resurrection is proof. Paul says, if Christ was not raised from the dead, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. We are unforgiven and those who have died have perished. But, but in fact, he concludes, Christ was raised from the dead. That is our assurance. Secondly, the resurrection assures us of God's power. The resurrection assures us of God's power. Can we change? Can we truly change? Are we able to change human nature? Is it possible for someone who is selfish to be unselfish, for someone who is immoral to be self-controlled, for someone who is cruel to become kind, wouldn't it be marvelous if that is possible? Growing up, I remember listening to a missionary story. This missionary was busy with his work evangelizing and turning people to Christ. And at one point of time, he meets this person whom he shares the gospel with. And then he says to him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are no longer of this particular faith background. You are now a Christian. Well, that man had nowhere else to go and because he needed help, the missionary took him under his care and employed him to help in his home. Well, sometime later, the missionary wanted a nice meal. And so he calls this man and he says, make me a nice hearty meal with some of this meat I have in the kitchen. I'd like a nice beef steak. And so he goes to his work and returns back later. Well, as he begins to have his meal, he is disappointed to find that it's no, not beef, it's not steak, it's just a bone of chicken. And he calls this man, he says, I know there was something, why did you get me chicken? I asked for beef. And his employer, the, uh, the cook says, well, we didn't have beef, it was not good enough. I found some chicken 
And I did what you did. I baptized it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are no longer chicken, you're beef. <laughs> that didn't work. Paul says that the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us today. That the Christian life is not simply turning a new leaf, not trying to become a little religious, putting church attendance in our schedule once a month, or a few superficial changes. Because when you scratch the surface, you have the same old self. There is no real change that has taken place. But becoming a disciple of Christ is nothing less than a resurrection from spiritual death. That there is an entirely new life in the power of the resurrection of Jesus. The same power that God worked to raise Jesus from the dead is at work in our lives today to make us alive and give us new things. Thirdly, the resurrection assures us of God's ultimate triumph. The resurrection assures us of God's ultimate triumph. Is there a future? Do we have hope? Well, some who looked at the world and examined and weighed weighty things offer no hope. A smart man like Bertrand Russell, he said, when I die, I believe I shall rot. And that is the end. All the labor of the ages, the inspiration, the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction. The whole temple of human achievement must inevitably be buried in the debris of a universe in ruins. We can be pessimistic as we think of the future, and it seems like our lives are futile. Even Eastern philosophy does not think in, a, in linear terms, but cyclically. You die, you, are, come, you come back to life, and that cycle repeats endlessly. There is an endless cycle of reincarnations. The law of karma is simply this. If you are bad, you are born again and you suffer. What if you're good? What if you're really, really good? Well, you come back to life again, but with good things. But there is no escape from that endless circle. It's futile. What is the point in being good? What is the point in being bad? You just live. We think life is so mechanical, biological, that we are simply molecules and atoms put together in some random fashion, living and dying. And in between, we try to do the best we can. The Christian hope is that Jesus comes in power, not in humility and weakness, but he will bring history to an end, that he will raise the dead and regenerate the universe. He will make everything new. The whole creation that is now groaning will be liberated at his coming. And there is freedom as children of God. Wishful thinking? Are we simply Christians whistling in the dark in order to keep our spirits up? Well, Easter reminds us that there is evidence. The evidence is that the evidence of a new creation is in the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus was raised from the dead and that's the promise we have, that all the old will be redeemed, transfigured. And the guarantee, the pledge we have, 
is in the resurrection of Jesus. That one day, you and me, all of us, all our loved ones, will be raised back to life, transfigured as he has promised. This Easter, we are reminded that the story of the resurrection is not just good news, it's great news. When Jesus says, whoever lives and believes in me will never die, it is not some vague hope. It is the promise that death has no power over us, that we are safe in Jesus' arms. Guilt cannot separate you from the Father. That whatever bad news you face, if you have crossed the line and you have given up on yourself, if you trust in Jesus, the resurrection is coming. To someone who is elderly, whose health is frail, who is almost gone, you don't have to live in fear. Your resurrection is coming. To the devastated husband who, whose wife has left you, if you feel betrayed and alone, you don't need to feel like all is lost. Your resurrection is coming. To frightened parents of a depressed child, you don't have to live with that burden of guilt. Your resurrection is coming. To an anxious worker who has lost their job, your resurrection is coming to a guilt-ridden addict hiding in the shadows, your resurrection is coming. To a lonely young person longing to be loved, your resurrection is coming. Whoever you are, if you have taken that important step and given your life to this new reality, the Father's arms are strong. None have been lost in his power, and he will pick you up. Our resurrection is coming. Let us pray. Lord, we rejoice that you are king, that you are the risen savior, and we come in awe in confusion, even doubt, but we come as we are. Save us, rescue us, equip us. In your name we pray. Amen. Yesterday we uh, bid farewell to Jack Norman, Mary Ellen's uh, husband. He was someone who loved nature, someone who was uh, involved with conserving nature. He loved reading his newspaper. He was well known in this town uh, as he met people, drank coffee, and uh, enjoyed making conversation. The good news of the resurrection is for him and for all of us. This morning, in his uh, honor, we will sing the next hymn as a memorial hymn. I invite the family who is here to remain seated while the rest of us stand together uh, and give thanks to God for what he is doing.
You may be seated. Today I'm happy to uh, welcome Ryan and Amanda. Ryan is uh, Mark's son who is visiting, and uh, we have some good news. I'm told that uh, Ryan is now engaged to Amanda, and they are looking forward to getting married later this year in the month of July. We rejoice with you, and we praise God for that. Well, Ryan, Dad wanted me to mention that he's extremely proud of you, and he loves you very much. He appreciates your Christian values, your judgment, and the decisions you have made throughout life. We are so happy to have you uh, worshiping here with us. Mark, our invoice will be in the mail for saying all of these nice things. <laughs> Last Sunday, for those who missed it, we had the Columbia Ambulance Department sharing some good information with us. They have a pouch magnet that would be helpful for senior citizens, uh, senior members, or anyone who lives alone. Uh, this is available with us, and if you would like one, please uh, meet us at the Welcome Center. We also have a lot of things to pray for. Zach Maui is an officially a teenager today. <laughs> we praise God. Um, we also pray for some of these needs loved ones who are suffering and struggling. Sandy Kirkpatrick has been diagnosed with cancer and is having surgery on the 8th of April. Lacey Green, just 34 years old with stage four cancer. This is Judy Ricky's niece. And Gilbert Cooper, who passed away uh, this week uh, we will remember some of these needs as we look to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, you came into our broken world. You took on yourself humiliation, rejection, even ultimately death. And while we are these disciples who live in hope, in confusion, who have heard these rumors from witnesses of your resurrection, teach us, O oh Lord, to understand and experience fully and completely the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead and that raises us from our despair. We pray, Lord, for these dear ones and the needs that have been shared. Lord, our hearts break with them, but may the good news of your resurrection fill their hearts with joy, with peace, and with the assurance that you are able to save. We remember, O oh Lord, those over here with needs and concerns, needs that only you would know, and we ask for your redemptive power to save us all. We pray for the grieving family of Jack Norman, that you would comfort them and give them your peace. We rejoice with Zach as he celebrates his birthday. And we give you thanks for how you work in our lives for Ryan and Amanda. All of this we rejoice and give thanks to you in Jesus' name, who taught us to say while we pray, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now bring to God his tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Lord, you have given us your only Son. What can be given return except our lives, our worship? As we come in obedience, may we learn that our true security lies in you alone. Bless this offering. Bless both gift and giver and use both for your kingdom's sake. Amen. As we come together to celebrate the feast prepared for us, I would remind you that this is not the UCC table, this is the Lord's table, that we can come together in grace. I invite all of you, as you are able, to come and receive and join us for the communion. The bread that we use is gluten-free, and the wine, we have both wine and grape juice for those who would prefer either. We praise you, Almighty Father Almighty, the unseen God, through your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has saved us by his death, paid the price of Adam's sin, and reconciled us once again to you. For this is the Passover feast, when Christ, the true Lamb of God, is slain, whose blood consecrates the homes of all the faithful. This is the night when you first saved our ancestors, freeing Israel from her slavery and leading her safely through the sea. This is the night when Jesus Christ vanquished hell, broke the chains of death, and rose triumphant from the grave. This is the night when all who believe in Him are freed from sin, restored to grace and holiness, and share the victory of Christ. This is the night that gave us back what we had lost. Beyond our deepest dreams, you made us, made even our sin a happy fault. Most blessed of all nights, evil and hatred are put to flight, and sin is washed away, lost innocence regained, and morning turned to joy. Night truly blessed, when hatred is cast out, peace and justice find a home, and heaven is joined to earth, and all creation reconciled to you. Therefore, Heavenly Father, this is our Easter joy. Accept our sacrifice of praise, your church's solemn offering. For Christ is the morning star that has risen in glory. Christ is risen from the dead, and his flame of love still burns within us. Christ sheds his peaceful light on all the world. Christ lives and reigns forever and ever. Remember how the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We remember Jesus' life. Jesus lived for us. We mourn Jesus' death, an act of brutal injustice. And we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, looking forward to the time when all your people gather in peace to share the feast where all are fed as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, descend upon the feast and upon your people gathered here. Make this meal a sign of freedom and new life for all. Transform this simple food into a holy feast as you transform our lives into ministries to the world. Behold, the bread of life broken for the healing of the world 
and the cup of blessing poured out for all reconciliation. As Christ is the host of this meal, all who desire communion with Him and community with each other are welcome at this feast. Come, for all things are now ready. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you. Take, eat, and be thankful.
the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and be thankful. O oh God, we thank you for inviting us to this simple and holy feast. We thank you for this brief moment of oneness with each other and with all who gather at this feast around the world and with all of creation. We thank you for Christ, whom we strive to follow. May this meal strengthen us to love and serve you and our neighbors near and far. Amen. Are there any announcements? I just wanted to thank everyone for those that gave money for the flowers to beautify our sanctuary this morning and a reminder to take those with you when you leave. And a reminder also that the flowers on the window you may take, but please leave the baskets. Those are the personal property of Dean. And also, today's March 31st, so it's the end of our month, and our mission for this month was food justice. So if you haven't given already, please do so. There's the box in the Welcome Center. And I understand that the Hunger Action Team from the Illinois South Conference has written an article that's coming out this next week about our mission for food justice this month. And our, month, our mission for April will be Twigs. And for those of you that aren't familiar with TWIGS, it's our summer lunch program that we help with the Cahokia and Dupo churches to bring lunches to those children that probably won't get a lunch if they're not in school. And so we'll be collecting money for that. So look for that box out next month. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so if you've noticed, today is the fifth Sunday, um, and we normally do our fifth Sunday potlucks, but we decided not to do one this Sunday because it's Easter. Um, and so since our next one would not be until the summer, the evangelism team has decided that we are going to have a potluck on April 14th, so it's in a couple weeks. Um, and for this one, we are going to be celebrating everyone's birthday. So we did something similar last year where everyone came and we celebrated your birthday and we mixed it up and you sat with your birthday month. Um, so we're going to do that again this year, um, but it's going to be a potluck style. So we will have a sign up next Sunday so you can sign up with what you want to bring. If you don't have time to sign up, just bring something and bring your family, bring yourself um, and enjoy that fun celebrating everyone's birthday. That Sunday, I believe, we'll also be celebrating new members. Um, and so we have a new member class coming up next Sunday, and then we'll be accepting new members on the 14th as well. So a lot to celebrate um, in April. So we hope to see you at our not fifth Sunday potluck, the 14th, to celebrate everyone's birthday and our new members. Well, I have two quick things to say. One is, uh, we are receiving new members on the 14th of April. That will coincide with our birthday celebration. So the 14th of April, we will receive new members in the service. And on the 7th of April, we will have a meeting uh, for those who are interested. So if you would like to become a member, please let me know. And we will meet after the service on the 7th of April. Finally, I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone who was part of uh, helping with our services in, in this entire season. D Denise, helping with the Christian education. Debbie uh, Walmart, for helping with all of these services, uh, and also the music this morning at the sunrise service. Uh, for Dean, for all the decorations, for the entire board of worship, uh, the choir, the music teams, and the sound AV guys who do a ph phenomenal job every service. In closing, shall we all stand together and sing hymn number 
242. as God's chosen witnesses to testify that Christ has been raised and that we are raised with him. Do not look for him among the dead, but be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And may God raise you from all that would entomb you. May Christ Jesus call you by name and go ahead of you. And may the Holy Spirit empower you for all that is good. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.